اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان لا اله الا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول In the name of Almighty God, Allah, most gracious, most merciful, welcome to another session of The Safe Zone. My name is Safe Dean Hansen, your host. And once I grin again, I greet you with the greeting of peace, the greeting of all the prophets of God, of Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. <clears throat> peace be upon all of them. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. The purpose of our show is to present the noble teachings of Islam. As they were revealed in the Quran, the last book that Almighty God revealed to humanity, and the actions and sayings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who was born over 1400 years ago. Despite the fact that Muslims are almost one fourth of the world's population, Islam is often distorted, misrepresented, and misconstrued in temporary society. We pray that this show will shed some light on Islam and misspell some of the commonly held misconceptions that have ignited ignorance, bigotry, and hatred. We pray the people of all faiths will come together to make this a world of toleration, understanding, and peace. Islam, what is Islam? Islam is an Arabic word which is derived from the Arabic roots of silm and salam. These terms mean submission, obedience, and peace. As a way of life, Islam calls for complete submission to the will of Almighty God Allah in order to obtain peace. A Muslim is one who freely and willingly accepts the supreme power of Almighty God Allah and strives to organize his or her life in accordance with the teachings and guidance of Almighty God Allah. Muhammadanism is a misnomer to Islam and offends the very spirit of Islam, for Muslims do not worship the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Islam is not a new way of life, it's the same message that Almighty God Allah revealed from time to time to all prophets and messengers. Allah has told us to say, we believe in Allah. God, and that was what was revealed to us, and that was what was revealed to Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and that which was given to Moses and Jesus and to all the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between one and another of them, and we bow our wills to Almighty God in Islam. The message that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, after former messages were lost or changed, 
is only Islam in its comprehensive, complete, and final form. Once again, we welcome you to The Safe Zone. My name is Saif Dean Hassan, and I welcome you once again to The Safe Zone. And I'd first like to say uh, Ramadan Mubarak to all the Muslims out there. Uh, this is the holy month of Ramadan, which we're going to spend most of our uh, topic today. We'll be talking about Ramadan or the Muslim holy month of fasting. But before I get into that today, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the issues that have taken place uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, while I was actually in Turkey, there was a, a bombing uh, in Sri Lanka of the churches, uh, you know, there. And of course, all the Muslim organizations, individuals condemned this, this heinous act of cowardice and, and violence. And we Muslims, you know, for one thing, we've talked about this many times. I don't want to get into it in detail, but, you know, it is forbidden for Muslims to attack places of worship. You know, it's forbidden for Muslims to attack innocent people period as we said even in times of war our prophet muhammad peace and blessings be upon him forbid the killing of women and children the old the people working in the field the people worshiping in their in their in their places of worship and you can't kill livestock and you can't even cut down a tree so during times of war you don't strike people in the face he even said you know so this is is something that is very fundamental in islam but for some reason they're people they're individuals as our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said that there will be a people who will come, you know, in times of strife, when the Muslims are in, in particular times of strife. One man said, actually, uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, be just. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, he said, Who's, who will be just if I don't be just? The Prophet Muhammad was delivering out, you know, money and sharing it with the different companions. And this one man said, you know, be just. So one of the companions got angry and said, you know, O Messenger of Allah, can I take care of him? And he said, no, of course, I don't want people to say that, you know, the Prophet Muhammad kills his companions. And then he said, but there will be a people who will come whose prayers, you know, in, in you know, later times, whose prayers will be better than your prayers, whose fasting will be better than your fasting, but Islam won't go past their throats. And they will leave Islam as an arrow goes through its prey. You know, so he was talking about a particular people and they popped up came about right after the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and they were called the Khawarij. And these people were a group of people who, you know, just wreak havoc in the Muslim community. And they caused much strife, and, and they, they, you know, had these crazy extreme interpretations of the Quran and the sayings of Prophet Muhammad. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he said, and, and especially in times of strife, that these people will come up, and they will last until the day of judgment, until actually till Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, returns to the earth that these people would last up until then but one of the char their characteristics that he mentioned which we're even seeing in these times because in the time of the prophet muhammad they came about but they weren't really you know really big but in the time of ali who was the fourth successor of the prophet muhammad peace and best be upon him you know he had to fight against them and the reason why he did he would send people out there to talk to them and try to reason with them and many of them returned back to the fold of islam but many of them didn't. So Ali Rajalan, may, may God be pleased when he said, you know, just stay, just leave us. You want to pray with us, come pray with us, but don't bother the, the main body of the Muslims. So one day, one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad is walking with his wife and they didn't like him because he was one, just because he was one of the companions. So they killed him and they killed his wife and they cut the baby out of her stomach. And Ali, may Allah be pleased and said, that's enough. He said, we have to deal with them. We have to fight them. We have to stop them, you know, and our prophet Muhammad, peace and best be upon him. He said, you know, that if he was living in those times that he would fight them, you know, because they were so extreme that they say that they're Muslims, but their actions are just the opposite of Islam. They kill, they're violent. And some of the characteristics that he said that they will be young in age, they will be very immature. They will misinterpret the Quran to think that it's for them and it's really against them. You know, they will be, as I said, extreme and oppressive and bloodthirsty and violent. These are the things that he said over 1400 years ago about these particular groups of people. And we see this happening that we have so many, especially some of the young people who are being swayed, you know, toward these towards these extremist groups, you know, who are being swayed, you know, because they don't understand Islam. They don't know Islam. They don't listen to the scholars. They don't listen to the people who have the knowledge. And most of these people who are committing these extreme acts don't have any knowledge of Islam. 
this is the one thing, even the CNN did a documentary on it, where they said most of these people, they weren't even praying. They didn't even know how to pray. They, you know, they were just all caught up in the emotions of what's happening to Muslims around the world, the oppression and so forth and different things that are happening, that they just started joining these groups. And they had no idea what they were doing because they were people who weren't even religious. You know, so these are just some of the things I just wanted to mention. But I said in the strongest terms that we as Muslims condemn all these acts of violence, whether it's against churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, whatever it might be. And, you know, as a result of all of this madness and craziness, we see what's happening in Sri Lanka today that, you know, a few individuals thought that they could do something like, oh, we're going to go and we're going to, you know, retaliate. You know, this is not even a part of Islam either. You know, revenge and all of this stuff. Revenge is with Almighty God Allah. You know, this is why in the history of Islam, you didn't see the Muslims even after we had been slaughtered you know, by non-Muslims. We didn't go back and slaughter them because they did this, as in the case of the Prophet Muhammad, as in the case of the Crusades and Salah al-Din and all these different things and the Inquisitions and all of these types of things. No, the Muslims didn't do that because this is not the way of Islam. We don't have this revenge, you know, that you automatically go back and retaliate against people. This is not what Islam talks about, you know. So, you know, we have now happening in Sri Lanka, you know, we see that, you know, people are attacking the Muslims, they're killing Muslims, they're, you know, burning down their shops, you know, burning down their homes, all of these different things, you know. So these are the repercussions when people continue these, this wave of violence, you know, against one another. And as we've said, you know, we have to come to the understanding that we are one human family, regardless of our backgrounds and so forth. We have our differences. But we shouldn't let that be a means for us to commit these violent acts against each other. So much to the point that now we've had one of our masjid, one of our mosques here in New Haven, uh, the masjid, the Turkish masjid on Middletown Avenue that was burned. And of course, you know, they did an investigation and found that it was deliberately burned. And it's pretty much burned to the point now that it's, you know, inhabit uninhabitable. So the Muslims can't go there to worship. You know, this is the month of Ramadan. This is the month where Muslims are, you know, engaged in worship and fasting. And, you know, there's a special prayer at night called the Tarawiyah prayer, which, you know, is about an hour and a half. So you find thousands of Muslims. The, the masjids are packed all around the world, you know, because this is a special time, you know, for the Muslims during this 29 to 30 days. So we're just going to talk a little bit about fasting and uh, what it means to Muslims and how important this month of Ramadan is for Muslims. And what is the essence of Ramadan? First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min shaitan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, Ya ayyuhal ladhina aminu kutiba alaykum usiyam, kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum la'alakum tattakun. That Almighty God says in the Quran that fasting is prescribed for you, O you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you, as it was prescribed for those who came before you, so that you may learn God consciousness, taqwa. So the essence of, you know, fasting, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, is to learn taqwa, to learn patience, to learn, you know, uh, perseverance, to learn steadfastness, to learn all of these things that you need to equip yourself with to deal with the, the, the struggles of daily life. And fasting is a means in which Muslims get closer to their creator. And as, a, as Allah says in, this, in the Quran, that this is not something that was new. Fasting was prescribed for Jews, for Christians, for all religions, all peoples throughout history as a means to get closer to their creator. And so we have this form of God consciousness in Islam where Muslims, for particularly, it's one of the five pillars of Islam. You know, as we know, we've talked about it to say the Shahada, declare your belief in Islam. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. This is the first uh, prerequisite for becoming Muslim. And then you pray five times a day. And then you give zakah or charity, two and a half percent of your excess income. These things are obligatory on the Muslims, praying five times a day, giving in charity, two and a half percent of your excess income. And then going to the house in Mecca once in a lifetime, if you have the ability, the financial ability, the physical ability to do so, and fasting during the month of Ramadan. And Ramadan comes in the ninth month of the Muslim lunar calendar. So the Muslim lunar calendar is different from the Gregorian calendar, and that is 11 or 12 days shorter. So every year, Ramadan comes in 11 or 12 days shorter than the previous year. 
So if you're someone, for example, who's been Muslim for 40 years, I started, you know, fasting in July. I've already like completed a cycle, you know, of fasting every month of the year. You know, so you, you fast when those days are hot. You fast when the days are cold. You fast when the days are long. You fast when the, when the days are short. You know, so you have this opportunity to fast throughout the year. The year. So this m lunar uh, calendar, as we said, the ninth month of the lunar calendar, where Muslims abstain from food, they abstain from drink, water, beverages, anything, and, you know, cohabitation with their spouses during the daylight hours. So from dawn to sunset, a Muslim is not allowed, Muslim woman, uh, Muslim man, and Muslim children, if they want to do it, you know, if they're of age, if they've reached puberty, you know, it starts to become obligatory on them. But I know most of the, you know, the children, they, they want to fast. My children started fasting at like eight and nine, and we would tell them, break your fast. No, you shouldn't be fasting. They were like, no, they start crying. No, I want to fast. I don't want to break my fast. You know, now some of them are 30 something years old. They find it difficult to fast when they were eight, nine years old. They were able to fast with no problem and they would cry. And we would try to get them to break their fast, you know. But uh, you you fast from dawn to sunset. So right now the fast starts at around 4 a.m. in the morning. People get up, you know, maybe about 3.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. They have a, a small meal, which is called the sahur. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said that there are blessings in the Sahur. So, you know, the people should get up and partake in this, this blessed, you know, breakfast before you start to fast. You know, and that can consist of something very light as drinking water and juice or something of this nature or just having a full meal. It's up to you. You know, most people get up and eat something very light and that usually gets them through the day. And then you start your fast around four o'clock a.m. You you do your Fajr prayer, your prayer that, you know, comes, you know, before the sun rises and then you can sleep, go to work or do whatever you have to do through the course of your day. And then uh, once the sun sets, which is around seven, excuse me, eight o'clock now, a couple of minutes after eight o'clock, then you break your fast. And usually the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, will break his fast with dates and water. And, you know, he talked about how the dates help to curb that hunger and so forth and so on. So these are the basic things that we do. And we also know that now so many of our medical doctors and people out there are talking about how fasting is good for the body how fasting because it kills the cells, the, the bad cells, and it replenishes new cells. So these are some of the, the physical aspects of fasting. So Almighty God, and we're starting to discover so many things that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did in his time that are, that are you know, like, uh, you know, right now they're saying this is good for this or this is good for that. For example, a friend of mine, he was doing his prayer, and a chiropractor said, oh, my God, your prayer, that's good for the back. You know, that's that's good for your, you know, your lower back, you know, because we have to actually bend over in Ruku by placing our hands on our, our knees. And then you make us what is called a sajda where you completely put your forehead to the ground. And he was saying, oh, man, that's good for your back. And we know now that, you know, we make will do every day. This is supposed to be good for arthritis, putting water constantly on your your limbs and so forth. This is good for arthritis and other ailments. You know, so there's so many things that there is science are now discovering that we do on a daily basis as Muslims that is good for your health. But that's not, as we said, the essence of fasting. Fasting is to get closer to Almighty God Allah and to gain God consciousness and to have all the things that we need. Because what are we doing? During this these days, we're giving up our main necessities, the things that we actually need. We, are, we, we have to survive every day by drinking, by eating. If we don't eat, if we don't drink, We'll cease to exist. We'll die. But these are the nas. These are the desires that we're giving up throughout the day so that we can not only, you know, do this on a regular basis when Ramadan is over, that we're willing to, to make these sacrifices, but we also feel the pains of those people who don't have. We're able to eat and we're able, as the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessed be upon him, said, you get the joy of breaking your fast. It's so nice after you fasted all day, you haven't eaten anything, you haven't drank anything, and then all of a sudden, you're able to break that fast and you feel this joy. You feel this overwhelming, like good feeling that you got through the day, but you're able to, to eat and you're able to drink. But there's so many people in the world who are fasting constantly for days. They don't have water, even clean drinking water. We're living in the 21st century and there's still people that don't have clean drinking water. 
And there are people who are starving. We have people who have billions of dollars and spend billions of dollars on boats and cars and houses and all of these things. And they don't care about their fellow human being. So this tries to bring Muslims closer to their fellow human being by wanting to give. And you see that during Ramadan, especially during Ramadan, it says that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was the most generous of human beings. But during the month of Ramadan, he was even more generous than the generous. He was the most generous person that he would give everything he had. And when he died, he didn't die with a big palace. He didn't die with thousands of camels and horses. He died with basically nothing. He had a few silvers, a soup, two pieces of silver that he gave in charity before he died. And when they came into his, his chamber, they just saw him sleeping on a reed mat. And one time, the, one of the companions said to him, Oh, Messenger of Allah, you know, the kings of Persia and Byzantium, they live in these great palaces. And look at you. You live you living on this reed mat in this small place. And I can see the, the, you know, the reed mat marks all on your back. And he said, oh, son of Qatab, oh, Umar, I'm surprised that you're saying this. He's saying, don't you know that this is not our world? That the Prophet Muhammad, he didn't care about all of these things. He could have had everything. The Quraysh, when they wanted him to stop preaching Islam, they said, we'll give you anything you want. We'll give you the, you know, the, the best house, the best camels, the best women, the keys to the Kaaba. We'll make you our king. We'll make you the richest person in Arabia. And he said, if they would have put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I won't give up this message, which is from God. So he could have had all of the luxuries of this world, but he chose the life in the next world, in the hereafter. So just to, to give you a better understanding, because some people may say, oh, wow, you know, I give up my food, I give up my drink. That's what fasting is about. That's not just what it's about. Because the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he said something very significant. And this is one of the things we want to talk about today. And hopefully this will give some light as to how our Prophet Muhammad was, what he talked about in the essence of this message of Islam, that he said that if a person does not give up lying and backbiting and other bad deeds, that Almighty God Allah is, no, is in no need of you giving up your food and your drink. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was letting people know that, you know, if you don't stop your bad deeds and your bad actions and your your immoral character and bad conduct, then Almighty God is in no need of you giving up your food and your drink. So fasting is just a physical aspect of what Muslims are doing. But the essence of fasting is supposed to make you a better person. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, that even if someone comes to fight with you and someone is quarreling with you, just leave them. Say, look, I'm fasting. I am fasting. And he said that there are some people who only thing they get from fasting is hunger and some people the only thing they get from fasting is thirst so this is not the essence of what fasting is fasting is supposed to get you closer to allah god consciousness as he said what will get people to heaven two things he said will get people to heaven being god consciousness and he said husnul khula wa taqullaha wa husnul khula he said being good or being god conscious and being having good conduct good morals, and good character. And one of the things that the Prophet Muhammad said, something that was very important, he said, He said, I have not come but to perfect good character and conduct. This is such a remarkable statement from a human being that he came to better the human being. He came to give an example so that people will be good in their conduct. So now you see all these people who are running around blowing up stuff and killing innocent people. This is not the conduct that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the way he conducted himself, nor did he teach us to do these things. So he said, I have not come to, but to perfect good character. And the Quran says, I have not come, or we have sent you with an exalted standard of character. An exalted standard of character. And the, the Quran says many verses, we have sent the messenger to an unlettered people, to show them between right and wrong, to purify them, even though they were in manifest error. We know all the things that the people were doing in Arabia before the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they were worshiping over 360 idols. They would devour the poor. They would kill, you know, the downtrodden, the slaves. Treated people, you know, the women, you know, treated them terribly. You know, the, the, as I said, the, the strong would devour the weak. 
you know, they had all these tribal wars, all these things that were going on. And the Prophet Muhammad, when one, one man said, go to him and look at him and see what he's talking about. We see this man, he's coming to us and he's talking about all of these things. He said, I want you to go and I want you to find out what he's talking about. And he said, when he went to him, he went to Mecca and he said he went back to his brother and he said he is teaching people good morals and good character and he is not a man that is a poet. So what he's saying, you know, because at that time, the people of Arabia, they were into poetry and they would have these contests. So one of the things about the Quran, it came as a challenge to them because they thought they were the best in language. And when the Quran was revealed, they, they immediately said, whoa, what is this? This is an amazing language in Arabic. And so many people just accepted Islam from hearing the Quran. And then even the people that were fighting the Prophet Muhammad, peace and best be upon him, they used to catch each other behind the Prophet Muhammad's house. And they were like, well, what are you doing here? You know, even though they hated the Prophet Muhammad and they hated the message, they said, I came to listen to the Quran. I came to listen to the Prophet Muhammad recite the Quran because they couldn't get by the beauty of the Quran. But what I'm trying to get to, brothers and sisters, is that fasting is just not giving up your food and your drink. But fasting is trying to teach you to be a better human being, to be better towards your fellow man, to have good character and have good morals. And I just wanted to read some of the things that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, you know, in regards to this, you know, having good character and having good morals. And it was once a man came to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and he said, what is religion? And he said, good character, good conduct. And he went behind him and he said, what is religion? He said, good conduct. Again, and he went to his right and he went to his left and he said, what is religion? And he said, good conduct and morals, good character. And so he went to him and he said again, and what is bad? He said, what is misfortune? And he said, bad conduct. So once again, you know, you know the, the best of people, as the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, those people, as we mentioned, that will get to heaven are those people who are God conscious and have good character. And he said, you know, peace and blessings be upon him, I guarantee a place in heaven for the man who even when he's arguing in the lower part of heaven, that even when he's right and he's arguing, he stops arguing. And I guarantee a place in the middle part of heaven for a man who does not lie even when he's joking. And I guarantee paradise, a place in heaven for the man who has the best character. And he said, peace and blessings be upon him, the best of you in Islam are the best in character. Peace and blessing be upon him. Such amazing things. He said, through his manners and good conduct, the believer can attain the status of a person who frequently fasts and prays at night. On the day of resurrection, nothing will be heavier in the scale of good deeds of a believer than good conduct. Allah hates the one who swears and hurts and uses obscenities. And he made a beautiful dua. When he would look in the mirror, he said, Oh Allah, make my character beautiful as you have made my appearance beautiful. So these are the, the, the beautiful words of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. He, peace and blessing be upon him, said, The most complete of the believers in faith are those who with the, have the most excellent character. And the best of you and the best in behavior is the ones who are best towards women. So, I mean, this is another thing, you know, oh, oh Muslims, they treat their women, they mistreat them. As we said, he said, khayrukum, khayrukum nisa. The best of you are those who are kind towards women. You know, he said, khayrukum, khayrukum li ahlihi wa ana khayrukum li ahlihi. The best of you are those who are kind towards your family, and I'm the best of you towards your family. And then he said, khayrukum, khayrukum li nisa. The best of you are those who are kind towards women. So he made this in his final statement. He said, they are those who are under your care, so take care of them. Be, befriend them, be kind to them. Don't beat them and all of this stuff. As we know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, never hit a woman in his life. Never beat a, a slave. Never hit a servant. Never hit an animal. None of these things. So this is the way he was. You know, everybody brings this one hadith where the Prophet tapped his wife. His wife got, you know, was spying on him, you know, following him around. He said, didn't you believe where I was going? And he tapped her in the chest. You know, she said it hurt. You know, so he was he was like a love tap, you know, t just touching her, you know. But this whole idea that Muslims can beat their wives and all of this stuff is completely haram, as all of our scholars have, have said this is completely forbidden. And any Muslim that do this, you know, is, is going against the essence of Islam again. 
but this is some of the things the Islamophobes use. You know, they we've quoted these verses that he tried to use to say it is permissible for a Muslim man to beat his wife. And we know this is, as Muslims, we know this is not true. And I know that even in, in back in the day, if we knew a brother was beating his wife, he would get a visit from the brothers, from the community, and we would correct them. So Allah says again, his messenger said, good character will be the heaviest righteous deed to be placed on a person's scale on the day of judgment. He said, no deed that will be placed on the scale of deeds on the day of judgment will be heavier than good character. Indeed, a person with good character will attain the ranks of those with a record of voluntary fast and praying. So this is, you know, some of the things, as we said, that we wanted to mention, you know, to, you know, uh, to you, our listeners, so that people could understand the essence of what fasting is and the essence of what Muslims are supposed to be doing. That Muslims are supposed to be an example to humanity. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Kuntum khayr ummatin ukhrijat nas." You are the best of people that have been raised up for mankind. You know, because you enjoy what is right and you forbid what is wrong and you believe in God. So this is what makes people high in their rankings, not because they're black or white, as we said, or rich or poor, but their closeness to their creator. So when the Prophet Muhammad, peace and best be upon him, was sending one of his, you know, uh, companions to be the governor of Yemen, he said, Ya Mu'ad, ahsanu khuluquka linnas. He said, behave well towards the people. And then, you know, he said, Ittaqi lahi haythuma kunt. You know, fear God wherever you are and follow up a bad deed with a good deed and behave well towards people. So this, is, this was the way of Islam, you know. So one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and best be upon him, he told his companions, he said, <clears throat> B, you know, uh, even though, you know, you're not saying a, a single word, he said, when you call people to Islam, be good or be, you know, uh, uh, subhanAllah. He said, you know, be a da'i, be a caller to Islam, even if you don't say a single word. And they said, how are we going to call people to Islam? You know, how are we going to talk to the people about Islam if we don't say anything to them? And he said, be husnu khula with good character, that you be an example, you be an shining example of your character. So when people see you, they say, oh, wow, look at this man, you know, and this is the way, these are the, t the, the type of people that won over people to Islam. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and best be upon him, many people became Muslim because of his character. They, they saw him, you know, as we talked about the man that saw him said, this is what he's calling people towards. He's calling people towards good character and morals and all of these things. So people gravitated towards that. He called for equal rights for men and women. And, you know, people don't supposed to be slaves and all of this stuff that, you know, how you're mistreating people. So people saw this. And a lot of times who became Muslim first were the poor and the downtrodden. You know, we saw the Prophet Muhammad as Noah, alayhi salam. In his time, the people said, well, look at the people you keep, you know, with you, Noah. You know, we are the people that got the money. We got the power. And look at you. You got all these poor people around you. And Noah, alayhi salam, he responded, you know, these are the people who accepted my message. You know, these are the people, the downtrodden, the poor, the slaves, the beggars. These are the people. And, the, and, and in essence, most of the time, this is what you saw. You never saw the arrogant, the rich, the pompous, the arrogant. They didn't accept the truth. They didn't accept the message of Jesus and Moses and Abraham. We saw Nebuchadnezzar and, 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 and Nimrod, you know, all these arrogant, you know, tyrants who thought they were God, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, they thought they were gods, you know? So when the Moses came, when Jesus came, when Abraham came, peace and best be upon them, they were like, I'm God, you know? When Abraham argued with Nimrod, you know, Abraham said, my God is the one who, you know, uh, gives life and death. And Nimrod said, I give life and death. So he brought two people in. He was supposed to free them. They were two prisoners. He killed one and he said, I free the other. He said, I give life and death. And then Abraham said, my Lord is the one who rises the sun from the east and sets it in the west. Can you set it in the west and bring it up in the east? And he said, he was dumbfounded. You know, so this is what the essence of Islam is. This is what fasting is, trying to make us better people. And in essence, when we look at Islam, and we see how Islam spread. People say, oh, Islam spread by the sword. If we see some of the examples, how Muslims went to other countries, for example, in Indonesia, 
And I always say on, on this show and other shows that this is the shining example of how Islam didn't spread by the, by the sword. The most populous Muslim country in the world with almost 200 million people is Indonesia. There was never any armies that went there, just traders, just uh, people going there and they went and they traded with the people and people saw their honesty. They saw them praying. They saw their integrity. They saw their, their husnul khuluk, their good character. And the whole country accepted Islam. The whole country accepted Islam, you know? And this is how Islam spread, particularly in those areas, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, you know, that traders went, you know, to these countries, not armies. Yes, there were wars that, that happened. The Muslims were attacked by the Romans. They were attacked by the Persians, who were the two superpowers at that time. For the most part, they didn't even care about, you know, Arabia. Before Islam, they were like, leave them people alone. They're backwards and ignorant. You know, they were running around the Kaaba, the place of worship that we face. They were running around it naked at the time. So they felt they were backwards people, you know. So when the Muslims came, that they felt, you know, Islam became a threat to them. So the Persians attacked them and the Byzantines attacked them. And, then, and, and the Muslims were able to overpower them, even though they had these small group of people, you know. But it was their character and their integrity that won the hearts of people so we're going to take a little quick break. I know we don't have much time left, but I, I guess I'm running out of breath a little bit. We'll take a quick minute break, and then we're right back with The Safe Zone. <clears throat> this train sounding loud, glide on the peace train. This second, this second, come on, this train. Oh, I've been happy lately, thinking about the good things to come. And I believe it could be something good has begun. I've been smiling lately, dreaming about the world as one. And I believe it could be someday it's going to come. Someday it's going to come. Come take me home again. Mm -hmm. Come on, be strange. Someday it's going to come. Come on, be straight. Mm -hmm. Come take me home again. Peace train sounding loud and flat on the peace train. Mm -hmm. Come on, be straight. Peace say Kaya. Peace Kaya. Peace Kaya. Once again, welcome back to the Safe Zone. My name is Safedine Hassan, greeting you with the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. I just wanted to read a couple quick articles, uh, maybe to give a little, uh, you know, nicer. We see so much turmoil in the world, and we see all these things happening, all the murders and killings. And as we said, we just had one of our, our mosques burned uh, in Middletown, the Turkish Masjid. And, you know, our hearts and our prayers go out to the community there. And, you know, all we can say is may, may God guide these ignorant people who are going into places of worship, be they Muslim, Christian, Jewish, you know, black, white, whatever they are, racist. May God guide them, you know, and hopefully, you know, they, they will come around to their senses and, and not, you know, commit these acts. But I just wanted to talk a little bit, first of all, about it was a really good article I was reading uh, about our Latino brothers and sisters who are accepting Islam. And there's a, a serious phenomenon going on. Uh, that there are a lot of Latinos accepting Islam, uh, particularly in the United States right now. And back in like the 60s and 70s, you saw African-Americans come into Islam in groves. Now you're starting to see Lat Latino Americans, you know, come into Islam in groves. So I just want to read this quick article uh, for a second where uh, it says, like, dozens of community members in Texas, Bianca Guerrera, has recently attended an Islamic program at El Hadiyah Mosque in North Philadelphia, my hometown, where I was born, hosted by a Hispanic organization called Islam in Spanish. My decision didn't go over well. I got kicked out of my house. My situation isn't unique, said Guerrera, while calling her Christian family's response after her conversion to Islam when she was just 19 years old. The family of immigrants from El Salvador traveled to South Florida. Guerrera is now 35 years old, and lives in West Philadelphia, my hometown, West Philly. Fortunately, Guerrero's family eventually didn't only come to accept her, 
decision. In fact, both her mother and older sister became Muslim too, alhamdulillah. A Muslim Latino women receives Quranic copies, pamphlets, and videos from Islamic Spanish organizations which formed in 2001. According to the group, there are about 250,000 Latino Muslims in the United States. Islam in Spanish helps people who want to learn about Islam in their native language. And since 2016, they helped as much as 160 Spanish-speaking converts to Islam in just Houston, Texas. Jamie Mujahid Fletcher, a Colombian-born convert, is the founder of Islam in Spanish, and he plans to open a new central Islamic mosque in Houston. The organization in April program coincided with new statistics released from the Washington, D.C.-based Institute for Social Policy and Understanding that shows Hispanics are the fastest growing group in the U.S. to embrace Islam. So, mashallah, that is a 70% growth that there is happening. They said it's 700% growth in less than 10 years in how many, time, how many uh, Latinos are accepting Islam, mashallah. So, and a lot of them also, they trace their roots because of Muslim Spain. Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years where they built this civilization, you know, where Muslims, Christians, and Jews lived in peace together. Secondly, I wanted to mention our brother, uh, uh, Ennis Cantor, uh, who will be playing NBA playoffs, and their Portland Trailblazers are still in the playoffs. While observing the holy month of Ramadan, during which he abstains from eating or drinking from dawn to sunset for 30 days, 29 to 30 days. I actually work harder during Ramadan because my body's used to it, Cantor said in an interview with the New York Times. Cantor will not be the first NBA player to play through the holiday. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played through Ramadan. Akeem Olajuwon played through it. Uh, uh, my my good buddy uh, Chris Jackson uh, Abdul Rauf, uh, who had you know played through it as well, who had some of his best games during that month long period. Kareem, Kareem uh, excuse me, uh, Hakeem Olajuwon. Before I go to those teams, I say, hey, I'm a Muslim and I have to pray five times a day. Cantor said, and they respect it so much that they give me a prayer room. So before the game, after the game, before practice, before I fly out, I can go to that room wherever I need to pray. While Cantor has played basketball through Ramadan before, he has never done so in the playoffs. This is because Ramadan moves back 11 days each year, as we've mentioned, which is 11 days shorter than the traditional Gregorian, traditional Gregorian calendar. So I was going against players who were 30, 35 years, and I was only, only one fasting, he said, referring to the first time he played basketball while observing fast in Ramadan at the age of 16. When I would fast or break my fast, I was drinking so much water, like, man, there was no room for food left. SubhanAllah. So I just wanted to read that, you know. Uh, you know, he said that many of his, his teams have provided him with prayer room. He said he really misses one of his teammates uh, because, you know, he used to get the halal food, you know, which is the Muslim food, which is similar to the kosher, which, you know, you slaughter the meat by striking the neck and let all the blood out so all the impurities and all of those things drain out from that animal, and he said one of, I forget the actual uh, player that it was that he used to play for, and he said that, you know, they, he was mad, he was like, I, don't, I won't get the halal food anymore. So, so alhamdulillah, so, you know, this is just all a part of Ramadan, and as I said, you know, Muslims are trying to get closer to God, we're trying to be better human beings, better, you know, Muslims, better, uh, you know, workers, better people at our jobs, better people, in, you know, in our businesses, better people in everything that we do, you know, and the month of Ramadan is just one year of training, you know, to try to make us so that we carry this on throughout the year. So Ramadan is like a training so that Muslims every year, now that they, they, they abstain from food and drink, so it helps them learn self-restraint and patience and, and you know, self-control, all of these things, so that when those times come, you know, where, oh my God, you know, you, you can't control yourself. You think about Ramadan and how, you know, those times you were able to, to get closer to God, to abstain from the basic necessities of God, so that throughout the year you become a better person, a better human being, you know, and a, a better humanitarian, you know. So I just want to thank everyone for tuning into the Safe Zone this week. We'll probably uh, continue on in a couple of weeks. We'll still be in the month of Ramadan uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, Ramadan, as we said, goes uh, from 29 or 30 days. The, and we, we go a little different from the Gregorian calendar as it is 11 days shorter. And that is because we actually start Ramadan with the sighting of the crescent moon, whereas the lunar or the Gregorian calendar starts with the black moon. So it's a little bit different, as we said. And as we said, this causes the Muslims to be able to fast throughout the years at different times. So, so once again, we'd like to send you off once again with a salutation of peace. 
Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. Thank you. Our world knows too much pain, too much hatred, and too much suffering. And our condition will never change until we change what's within ourselves. So let's spark that change. First, we need the love. As we sail across the sea of life, so much pain, warring divides. It's a shame 